Antimatter is basically the opposite of normal baryonic matter. That statement is pretty confusing though. So what exactly is it? Well, it's matter that is composed of particles with a charge that is exactly the opposite of charged particles in normal matter. When normal matter comes in contact with antimatter, the reaction can be explosive. But did you know that astronomers have been searching for stars made of antimatter? Yeah, sounds like the stuff of science fiction. But here's the thing, there might be at least 14 anti-stars out there. And one of them might be shooting anti-helium at the Earth. We're going to talk about the new research on anti-stars while we try our hardest to explain what exactly antimatter is. But first, be sure to hit that like button, comment your favorite use of antimatter in science fiction, smash that subscribe button, and ring that bell to never miss a video. I'm Eric Malachite, author of Minds Horizon, and this is Science Get. As we just mentioned in the intro, antimatter particles are the exact mirror of normal particles. The main difference is that if normal hydrogen has a negative charge, antihydrogen will have a positive charge. Electrons have a negative charge, and the particle opposite of the electron, called a positron, has a positive charge. We've seen antimatter used in science fiction shows like Star Trek, The Next Generation, Angels and Demons, and a whole bunch of other novels and shows. These particles were first dreamed up by British physicist Paul Dirac. Now, Dirac was doing what every theoretical physicist is still trying to do, make general relativity play nice with quantum mechanics. Before Dirac's proposition, scientists were puzzled when they observed particles that had observed energies lower than when they were basically doing nothing or at rest. At the time, this seemed like it should have been impossible, as it would have meant that those energies could have been negative. But Dirac accepted that the equations were telling him that these particles were really filling a whole new area of lower energies, an area that up until this point had gone unobserved by physicists. A good analogy for this would be an iceberg. In this instance, the ice above the water would be normal particles, and the ice below the surface would be the negative, or in this case, positive charge of antimatter. Dirac envisioned that all of the normal energy levels we observe in normal particles exist in normal baryonic matter. But when a particle jumps up from one of these lower energy states, it appears just like normal matter, but with one exception. It has a hole in it, appearing as a strange mirror image reflection of a normal particle, or antimatter. Any doubts that the scientific community might have had about antimatter were quickly put to bed, as it was found that antimatter was clearly produced when cosmic rays hit the Earth's atmosphere. There is even evidence that thunderstorms produce positrons, but that's a different topic. It was also observed that positrons result from the decay of certain radioactive isotopes. Today, large supercolliders like the Large Hadron Collider, or LHC, are where most of the world's antimatter is produced. But more recently, physicists have been trying to figure out where the universe's antimatter went, and why it didn't annihilate all the matter in the universe. It's thought that the Big Bang must have created equal quantities of antimatter and matter. It's also thought that the laws of physics should have been the same if a particle was switched with its antiparticle counterpart, which is known as CP symmetry. But the universe we observe today doesn't seem to have much antimatter at all. So if it's true that the Big Bang created equal quantities of both, where did the antimatter go? And why didn't the normal matter and antimatter just annihilate each other from the very beginning? What's interesting is that observations of certain decaying radioactive processes don't actually produce equal amounts of particles and antiparticles. So theoretically, yes, thank you computer. Is it then possible that the Big Bang didn't produce equal amounts of antimatter and matter? Groups like the Alpha Collaboration at CERN are working with particles at much lower energy levels to see if antimatter particles really do behave like mirror opposites of their normal baryonic counterparts. In 2016, this work produced a single antihydrogen atom that was made from one antiproton and one positron. This antihydrogen atom was measured to be neutral and possesses less than one billionth of the charge of a single electron. Other measurements showed that the positron is basically equal and opposite to the charge of the electron. In other words, this confirms that antimatter behaves the way that Dirac predicted. 
Though while scientists are still trying to unravel the mystery of the Big Bang and antimatter, there might actually be stars made of antimatter lurking in the Milky Way. Fourteen of them, in fact. Cue the title card. As we've established, it's thought that at some point after the Big Bang, normal baryonic matter took over antimatter through some unknown process until the universe began to resemble its modern-day self. However, an instrument on the International Space Station recently detected what is thought to be hints of a few antihelium nuclei. If these observations are confirmed, it could mean that the Milky Way is home to at least one antimatter star, one that is shooting antihelium at the Earth. In total, there are 14 candidates for antimatter stars in the Milky Way, represented as 14 pinpricks of light on a gamma ray map of our night sky. A report published on April 20th of this year in Physical Review D suggests that the gamma rays that have been detected coming from these stars could be the result of them drawing in normal matter from interstellar space and annihilating it. Pierre Salati, a theoretical astrophysicist at the, I can't pronounce this name, so I'm just going to put it up on screen, Laboratory of Theoretical Physics in France, said, If by any chance one can prove the existence of the anti-stars, that would be a major blow for the standard cosmological model, and would really imply a significant change in our understanding of what happened in the early universe. Now, Pierre wasn't involved with the study but the researchers who were involved studied 10 years worth of observations taken by the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope. And among 5,800 gamma ray sources, 14 of those rays gave off similar energies that are matches for antimatter-matter interaction and annihilation. And these points of gamma ray light also did not look like any other known type of gamma ray source like a pulsar or a black hole. The team behind the report suggests that if anti-stars really do exist in the Milky Way and those objects were able to draw in gas and dust made from ordinary matter, then they would emit massive amounts of gamma rays and would be easily provable through observation. If these 14 candidates really are anti-stars, then it might suggest that only one anti-star exists per 400,000 stars made from normal baryonic matter. However, if these anti-stars tended to exist outside the plane of the galaxy, then they would have far fewer opportunities to interact with normal matter, and would be very, very hard to detect. If this were the case, the team believes that there could be one anti-star lurking in intergalactic space for every 10 normal stars. The only trouble with this report is that proving any of these 14 objects really are anti-stars might be extremely difficult, as the light given off from the explosive reaction that is thought to happen when normal matter interacts with antimatter would look just like the light that comes from any other star or object in the universe. Simon Deport, co-author of the study and astrophysicist at the Institute of Research in Astrophysics and Planetology in Toulouse, France, confirmed this when he said, It would be practically impossible to say that the candidates are actually anti-stars. It would be much easier to disprove. It suggested that astronomers will have to watch how the gamma rays and radio signals coming from these 14 potential anti-stars behave and change over time. As well as this, they will have to check for infrared signals to ensure that they aren't just pulsars or black holes. If there really are anti-stars in our Milky Way, it would imply that substantial amounts of antimatter somehow managed to survive in isolation from normal matter during the evolution of our universe. Julian Heek, a physicist at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, who was not involved with the study, says that this is just preliminary work, that it's an interesting development. But he doubts that anti-stars would be abundant enough to account for all the universe's missing antimatter. Going on to say that we would still need an explanation for why matter overall dominates over antimatter. Or, hey, maybe since our normal matter is all negatively charged, that means that we're really the evil universe. And there's a mirror copy of our universe with all positively charged matter that is good. <laughs> That would really explain 2020. If you dug this video, be sure to drop a like and comment your favorite science fiction story featuring antimatter. And be sure to smash that subscribe button, ring that bell to never miss an episode, and check out the Patreon while you're at it. Hey, speaking of, look at those names! Plus two new ones. Thank you, patrons. And it's done. I'm Eric Malachite, and I'll see you next time.